Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, wonderful for Wendy and I to be with you. My wife, Wendy, is here. If you could please stand. We celebrated 34 years of wedded bliss July 1st, so uh, celebrate with us. And uh, you can see our picture there. We uh, are a family, except our kids have grown up. They're young adults now. We have a 24-year-old daughter, Laura. She works in Philadelphia in public health. And Ellie and Eric are our 23-year-old twins. Ellie works in Philly also in the bicycle industry. And Eric works in Connecticut uh, in the computer industry. And so uh, our kids grew up with us in Bulgaria on the mission field. Yet it was Bulgaria that we were in, we're now in Belgium. So I guess if the Lord calls us to another country, it'll probably start with the letter B. Uh, but they are, they are back home now and uh, making their lives in, uh, in this area, in fact. And uh, so we have been missionaries for almost 30 years. Um, about 20 of those years were in Bulgaria, and we actually met a Bulgarian couple this morning in your church, um, Peter and uh, Doro... Dorotin, uh, Dobrinka, and uh, <clears throat> it was wonderful to talk with them. We don't meet many Bulgarians when we travel, uh, and and we led when we were in Bulgaria. We led the Sofia Pentecostal Bible College, which uh, trained pastors and missionaries, which was especially important after 50 years of communism, when they could not have any Bible training in that country. It has had a great impact on the church uh, in that country, and after. About 13 years of that, we were asked to oversee all of our missionaries in the southeastern Europe countries of the Balkans, about 11 countries, and, and uh, work with the European leaders of those churches. That was an amazing time as well. In 2017, Wendy and I were invited to go to Continental Theological Seminary. Um, it is a mouthful, absolutely, and that's why we call it CTS. Uh, those that are there call it CTS. So if I say CTS this morning, you'll know I'm talking about the seminary. Uh, in Brussels, Belgium, and interestingly enough, it's our alma mater. Wendy and I uh, studied there when we were in Bulgaria, and so we were actually coming back to a place that we knew. I would like to, um, to look this morning into God's Word, into uh, the book of John, chapter 14, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 5. But before I read it, and uh, if you're turning there, you'll have a little time, I want to give you a little context where we're at in this, uh, in this passage. So Jesus is 33 years old. Um, you know that he was 33 when he died, and he's actually in the same week that he will die when he's uh, talking to his disciples here. He's days away from his death, but he's been a Jewish rabbi for three years. He had his disciples, uh, those that were very close to him, and also a large crowd that followed him. He is had tried many times to explain to his disciples about his upcoming death uh, by crucifixion, but they were not able to understand him, and uh, they didn't understand what he was talking about. And we've all had that experience when the Lord has told us something and we just didn't understand it, um, but Jesus is patient. Uh, our, passion, our passage is set in what we call the Last Supper, which is the last time that Jesus had a meal with his disciples uh, before he was betrayed by Judas and condemned to death. Uh, once again, Jesus is trying to explain to them what's about to happen because they are totally unaware um, of what he's talking about. He said, I'm going someplace where you cannot follow. Um, that seems a little cryptic to us, but that was how he was trying to prepare them for his upcoming death. Uh, what, what they did understand, though, was that they felt some, some discomfort. They felt some anxiety. Is Jesus going to be taken from them? They had followed him closely for three years. They learned to do what he did. They spoke as he spoke. Uh, would he no longer be with them? And that was causing them great turmoil. So let's look into our passage where Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Which illustrates just how clear they were on what Jesus was saying. Uh, Belgium has three national languages, uh, French, Flemish, and German, and I'm going to read this passage also in French. Uh, we did meet with someone after the first service who lived in Belgium, and she said she could understand me, so that's a plus. Here goes. Jésus dit que votre cœur ne se trouble pas. Ayez foi en Dieu, ayez aussi foi en moi. Dans la maison de mon père, il y a beaucoup de demeures. Si ne c'était pas vrai, je vous l'aurais dit. En effet, je, vous, je vais vous préparer une place. Lorsque je vous aurai préparé une place, je reviendrai et je vous prendrai avec moi afin que vous soyez vous aussi là où je suis. Mais vous en connaissez le chemin. Thomas lui dit, « Seigneur, nous ne savons même pas où tu vas. » Comment pourrions-nous savoir par quel chemin on y parvient? May God add his blessing to his word this morning. So Jesus is talking about his death. He's trying to prepare his disciples for what is about to happen and trying to comfort them. And at the same time, they're worried that he's leaving them forever. Uh, they had been together constantly for three years. They lived together, they traveled together, they slept together, they ate together. This was a rabbi discipleship, uh, sorry, rabbi disciple relationship that we don't have a parallel for in our culture. Uh, but they were glued together for three years. Uh, traveling together is sometimes challenging. Um, you'll know if you've done any traveling that uh, different people have different needs and people like to stop often or not often, and people get hungry and tired and cranky. And I wonder, did the disciples ever ask Jesus, Lord, are we there yet? <laughs> probably, probably happened. So as Jesus comforts his disciples, notice he doesn't condemn them for their doubt or their, or their uh, just not getting it. Uh, even after years together, they still could not understand Jesus' primary mission on earth. And I'm, I'm so glad that he is also generous with us and, uh, and helps us to understand these things. So Jesus is telling them, I am going to the Father. And it's not so that Jesus could escape from this sin-filled world. I have no idea why Jesus was so willing to come to this place to die for our sins. It must have been awful for him, but he wasn't trying to escape this world. He was going to prepare a place for them, he said. And I find it meaningful that though Jesus and his disciples were homeless and wandered all around um, the, the, the promised land, Jesus was going to provide them places to live far beyond anything they could imagine in his Father's house for eternity. Jesus also reassures them that, that this separation would not be forever, that he would return to them and take them to be with him forever. So the separation was not permanent. And he said, when the time is, is coming for us to be together, I'm not going to send a messenger or send an invitation. I myself will come and bring you to be with me where I am. He will host us and welcome us in our eternal home. Now, in verse 4, Thomas had said, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Thomas talks first about the destination, and then he talks about the way there. But Jesus, when he answers, flips that, and he says, first, I am the way. He talks about himself being the way, and only later does he say, the way is to the Father. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And so the only way to, to the Father is through Jesus, but they know Jesus. So Jesus is trying to encourage them. You, you know me. You, 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 you've known me for three years. You believe in me. Believe also in the Father. And so Jesus says, I'm going to prepare you a place in heaven. Now, Jesus already said that his father's house has many rooms, and so Jesus wasn't going into heaven to do heavenly carpentry work. Um, those places already exist. Rather, Jesus' Jesus's point is to say, I'm going to prepare a way for you to get to the father's house and the rooms that he has for you. He is focusing on the path that he is making. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the, the way to those rooms is Jesus himself. He is preparing the way for them to go to his father's house by his own death for their sins. I'd like to talk a little bit about Europe right now. For those of you who don't know, Europe is in a very difficult state spiritually. Um, many times when we think of Europe, we think of the cathedrals and the revivals and the, even the Reformation and the hundred-year prayer meeting and those kinds of things did happen, uh, but that's not the situation in which Europe finds itself today. Europe is in desperate need for Christ. I have a picture here of uh, some glass jars with colored beans in them, and those white beans uh, on the left represent America with 30% of Americans that attend church regularly even after COVID. In Europe, the number is less than 3%. And so you can see on the right that a person who wanted to know God would have much less opportunity to know a Christian excuse me, to know a Christian or to visit a church or to hear the gospel. It's just not that common in Europe. That's the situation. And because of that, historically significant churches like cathedrals and, and, and uh, the huge buildings that we see um, are empty and they're being repurposed. And so, for example, in the town just north of where we live in Brussels, a church has become a brewery. A church has become a hotel. A church has become a cultural center and a church has become a library. Just to give you an idea, in the northern half of Belgium, the, uh, the Flemish part, there are 80 churches that we work with, the average size of which is 15. So if you look around today, you'll see this dwarfs any, any kind of church that we are familiar with in, uh, in Belgium. And in addition to that, there have been millions of Muslim immigrants coming into Europe, especially in the last number of years. You've seen it on the news. Uh, Belgium has three times as many Muslims as Christians. And in fact, in the capital city of Brussels, where we live, it has the highest concentration of Muslims of any European capital city. We have 25% uh, Muslim population. And that growing population also uh, requires even greater need for the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's why Wendy and I are so pleased to be part of Continental Theological Seminary, CTS, uh, raising up a new generation of pastors and missionaries that will touch Europe and the world. We typically have more than 30 countries represented in our student body. Students are not coming just from Europe, they come from all over the world. And we actually have graduates from Continental working in over 70 countries countries today. I want to show you some pictures of some of the students that we work with. Uh, these pictures were taken just a few weeks ago when we were still in Belgium, and we will be back in Belgium in less than a month, believe it or not. Uh, so the first person I want to show you is Benjamin. Benjamin was in just about every one of my classes that I taught, a great guy. The Lord saved him later in life, and he left a very lucrative business to come to Continental to be trained for the ministry. And this is quite common for our students. Uh, the CTS works very hard to keep costs low for students, but keep in mind in Europe, education is virtually free. And so when we have students that have to pay to, to live and to eat and to study at our school, uh, it still is a stretch for them financially. In this picture, um, I've just awarded scholarships to this group of students representing France, England, Portugal, Italy, and the U.S., Yes, United States people have found out about our school and they are coming there. Um, the next slide shows uh, a couple that are friends of ours, Jonathan and Letty. Um, Letty was uh, or is a nurse and she was working during COVID in Belgium. Belgium had a very high mortality rate at the beginning and they worked her to death, literally. They worked her unbelievably hard to the point where she uh, got PTSD and burnout she is now at CTS studying to, uh, to be used by God in the ministry. She's a student leader at Continental, and she's the only believer in her family. Uh, Jonathan, her friend, um, surprised Letty with a visit to a pottery-making 
place uh, in Belgium on her birthday, and they went there, and uh, there was a small group of people that were making these pottery things, and they had a chance to talk, and they asked Letty, what, what do you do? She said, I'm studying at Continental Theological Seminary, and they said, what is theology? Uh, and that gave her the opportunity to share with them uh, her testimony and what God is doing in her life and through her life there was a same-sex couple there that also had never heard about uh, any of these things. They work in a hair salon, and Jonathan uh, said that he is saving his money so that he can go and get a haircut there to talk with them more about Christ and his love. The next, uh, next slide shows a picture of our president. The president of Continental is Dr. Joseph Dimitrov uh, with a student. Interestingly, uh, Dr. Joseph is Bulgarian, and he and I worked together in the context of the school we were running in Sofia, Bulgaria uh, 30 years ago, and now here we are working closely together again in the school that he is leading in Belgium. It's, uh, it's Wendy's and my privilege and joy to work with students and leaders like this from all over the world, and thank you for allowing us to do that. One thing that I do, another thing that I do as I work at the school, we teach, uh, we administer, uh, but I also form partnerships between Continental and other groups and countries uh, so that we can spread the learning even more than, than we could otherwise. One of these partnerships is between Continental and Project Rescue. The, the certificate program is called Rescue and Restore. Uh, Project Rescue is an anti-human trafficking organization that works worldwide. Uh, more than 100 people have tr been trained through this certificate program so far. Um, Continental has also established partnerships in Ireland, Norway, and Spain. We expect there to be more added to that list as time goes on, and that's important because most European countries do not have a place like Continental where people can go and be trained for ministry, and so they're inviting us. Would you come and partner with us so that we can also train those people that God has called in our countries? Um, and unfortunately, it's also critical because in these last eight years, 10 semin uh, sorry, I got that wrong. In the last 10 years, eight seminaries have closed in Europe due to a lack of vision and a lack of a strong church and a lack of a desire to reach the lost. Um, however, our school, thankfully, is continuing to grow, and we are in the middle of a building program. You can see the building, you could see it maybe just before they took it off. Thank you. Uh, on the right there is, is a building you can see just the, the side of. That's where Wendy and I live on campus, and so this new building is literally being built in our front yard. Um, this picture was taken a few weeks ago. We need more space because we need more beds. We need more space in the cafeteria. We need a larger library. And we're doing all of that. And uh, thanks to this church and many others, um, all of this work has been, uh, sorry, the money to pay for all this work has been raised 80% of it has already been raised. And uh, I just want to thank you for that because it's because of your support that all this is happening. Amen. So we've talked about what is happening in Europe, and I, I want to give a shout out for BGMC. I understand this is a church that, uh, that supports BGMC. For those of you who don't know, uh, none of what we do would be possible without resources, and BGMC is a way in which the church supports missionaries. Uh, BGMC is a very powerful resource that every missionary relies on every day, and we are thrilled that you are raising funds for BGMC. Wendy and I have been privileged to use BGMC funds in so many ways, uh, for example, for disaster relief, for church building, uh, for, for Bibles and literature, and also for training pastors, and many other things. And so, uh, on behalf of all your missionaries, uh, those that you currently know and support, and those that you will come to know and support, I want to say thank you for your generosity, because giving to missions in that way really strengthens uh, the ministry that we have overseas. I want to return to our uh, passage this morning as we look at three implications for us. Uh, what does this passage speak to us? The first one I want to mention is that 
the point of this passage and what Jesus is wanting us to grasp is that we should not be anxious or troubled as we are apart from him. Um, let me repeat that. He does not want us to be troubled or anxious as we wait for him to return. And if he told his disciples that sev several times in several different ways. He does not want us to be concerned about our future. I know that all of us would rather have Jesus here in the flesh, uh, but Jesus said, it's actually better that I go because I will send the, the Holy Spirit to you. And that's wonderful. And we, we benefit from that. But God knows what's best. And even though we would prefer to have Jesus, uh, Jesus said, I need to go to the Father and I will prepare a place for you. We don't like what has become familiar and comfortable for us to be taken from us. But on the other hand, God is a God that does new things. He's not a God of stagnation. And so he will do new things and cause us to trust in him in even greater ways. Uh, Jesus took the time to explain to his disciples what was going to happen and why. He said, it's better for us that he is no longer present because when he ascends to the Father, he would send the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, to live in us as his disciples. And here's what he says about this later in John chapter 14. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you you of everything I have said to you. And again, he urges them not to be uh, concerned or troubled or anxious in this interim period. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus uses the word peace twice, peace given them to peace given them directly as if he was handing peace to each of his disciples personally. And I believe that if Jesus was here today, he would say the same thing to you. Peace, peace, I'm leaving you peace. And Jesus knew that what he was telling his followers would be difficult and upsetting and, and actually that the time without Jesus would be challenging for them. He knew that. And so Jesus actually comments on this same thing again a few chapters later when he said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Uh, I, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Normal peace for us happens when our lives are going well and things are good and, and we feel that peace coming from the outside. But the kind of peace Jesus is talking about here comes from the inside and is not dependent on our circumstances. And I'd like to invite Wendy at this point to come and share uh, one of the difficult, probably the most difficult situation we've ever had to en encounter and experience that happened about our kids. So Wendy, tell us about it. Good morning. We uh, had discovered or decided that we wanted to have two children because that would make it balanced, you know, one for each parent to take care of. And so we had our oldest daughter and then decided, okay, now's the time to expand our family. And so we went for uh, my ultrasound. Uh, and when I found out I was expecting, and we had a surprise. Bulgarian doctors, this was in Bulgaria, don't have the same bedside manner. So she said, you have two babies, not just one, you have two babies, but one will die. She said, it's half the size of the other baby, which is usually a very bad sign. And um, so of course we're, sh you know, we're shocked. And um, then she said, but both babies are very active and have strong heartbeats. And so we're, you know, we're there figuring it out. And she's not really going to, uh, you know, any effort to really explain what, what you know, is happening or what the options are. And so we're, uh, we're just wondering what we're supposed to do. And I said, well, is it possible that we conceived one and, and um, then a month later the other? Because she said there's a month difference. And she said, oh, it happens, but it's so rare that I can't imagine that happened to you, which actually they found in, when we came to the States that that's quite likely what happened. So uh, I remember the moment when I recognize the peace that God had given me. We returned home, and Kevin had to take a trip um, 
internationally. And so I was left alone at home. We at that point had our, what, she would have been 10 months old or something. And, uh, and so she, you know, our, and he was gone. And so I remember looking in the mirror and just feeling peace and looking, you know, it's kind of like, who is this person? You know, <laughs> had this very strange, very scary news. And, but I was okay. And we had to decide, are we going to stay here in Europe and have our have uh, the babies here, or are we going to go back to the States? And we ended up coming back to the States, and I delivered the babies at the same time. Uh, and Ellie was about 30 weeks, and Eric was about 34 weeks. And so um, there was a great size difference. Ellie was 3.2 pounds, and Eric was 4.4 pounds. So Eric was in the hospital one week, Ellie was in the hospital six weeks. They're all fine. They're both fine. They're doing very well. But it was a time when basically, I mean, if you have children, you know there is nothing more that gets to your heart and nothing more that, that hurts than to see your child hurt. And so, you know, for me to know and recognize God has got this, and it wasn't, you know, a fake piece because you really can't fake that. And um, so, so I was just so grateful that God carried me in that time and gave me his peace. And now when I encounter things that seem very upsetting, I remember myself looking in the mirror. Now, I looked a little different at that point, <laughs> a little younger, but I remember looking in the mirror and saying, you know what? This is something that only God can give. And he did. And I want to encourage you, if there is something that's overwhelming you in your life, that you, uh, you're able to look in the mirror and recognize that this is a person who trusts God and that I can have peace in the midst of whatever is happening. You can all take a moment and think in your lives when you may have experienced something that would normally have overwhelmed you, but for Jesus' peace, you had uh, that assurance that somehow it's going to work out okay. Uh, and thank the Lord that his peace is stronger than uh, our anxiety, or can be, and we need to, uh, he wants us to, to be in that place. The second implication that I find in this passage is that, that we are waiting for Jesus to return to the earth in exactly the same situation as his disciples were. When they watched him ascend into heaven, they were hoping for him to come back, and they didn't know when that would be, and we're still in the same situation. Jesus promised, I will come back, but he hasn't come back yet, and so we're also in that same interim period. Um, uh, theologians talk about this being the already but not yet period. We know what will happen. We know there's the victory. We know that we have places in heaven, and yet it's not happened yet. And so we're, we're in this state. Um, back to the issue of babies, uh, two of our Italian students uh, were expecting, and they, uh, they had a baby in June of this year. It was their firstborn. And that baby was growing, and we were all excited about it. And uh, the, the due date approached, and the due date was passed, and the doctor said, let's try to induce. And they did try to induce, but the baby didn't come out. We knew for sure the baby can't stay in there forever. Uh, but neither can you rush what God has planned. And eventually the baby was born and was healthy, and we thank God for that. Um, but it, it's, it's very much like that with Jesus' return. We know that it will happen. We don't know when it will happen. We know that it will happen. We don't know when it will happen. But there is no other outcome. There's no other scenario other than Jesus coming back as he promised he would and us going to be with him in heaven. It could be soon. It could be much later in the future. There's nothing we can do to hurry it up. And he will come when the time is right. And when he returns, he will take those who follow him to meet his father in heaven. 
Uh, it may feel like his coming is overdue as we look around the world and see lots of reasons why Jesus should come soon, uh, but we hold on until he comes and we will live forever with Jesus in heaven and that is our assured outcome. The Apostle Paul calls this the blessed hope of the church, our waiting for the glory of the appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you older ones, like Wendy and I, might remember uh, films in the 70s. Uh, one of them was called uh, Thief in the Night, and the theme song was I Wish We'd All Been Ready. Uh, anybody remember those, or is it just yes? Okay, a few. All right, I see those hands. Uh, more recently, there's been the Left Behind series, uh, which talked about the rapture, and maybe you've read the books or seen, seen those uh, movies um, those stories uh, have comforted people, but they've also caused some Christians to be anxious about the future. And, um, and I, I want you to know that we have, uh, we have no reason to fear the future. We are marked by the Holy Spirit. We have a solid assurance that unbelievers do not have. Those frightening scenarios are not our future. Uh, those images portray the opposite of the promise and the reality that we have. However, uh, it can be part of our testimony, the comfort that we have while we wait for Jesus. And it's clear that is biblical. He wants us to have peace. He wants our lives not to be characterized by anxiety and worry as we wait for his second coming. The third uh, implication that I find is how does all this impact us now? What does this mean for us? What does this passage say to us right now? Uh, the point that I want to make here is that because Jesus hasn't returned yet, it means we still have time to do his work. And let me unpack what that means to me. It means that we have time to share with others the promise of heaven, the promise of Jesus' second coming, the promise of God. We can speak about the beauty of heaven in contrast to the pain and suffering that we see all around us. Here's how Jesus describes uh, heaven in Matthew chapter 22. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. In fact, we do know why Jesus hasn't come yet, and it's because he's waiting so that more and more people can be gathered into his kingdom, and that's our job, actually. Uh, Jesus' disciple Peter explains, the Lord Jesus is not slow about keeping his promise of returning to us to take us to be with him forever in his Father's house because he wants as many as possible to be with him there. And that's exactly why we go as missionaries. That's exactly why all of us are working together to invite people into God's kingdom because there is still time. As long as Jesus hasn't come yet, there is still time for us to share the good news about all of this. Think about people you know who don't yet recognize what Jesus has done for them, or those who do not know that their future, their eternal joy, peace, and fulfillment is guaranteed if their relationship with God is right. How do you think they would feel knowing God has prepared a place specifically for them? Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many rooms, an eternal home with their name on it. I'd like to turn to God in prayer as we finish uh, this morning, and I will pray, and then I will ask a few questions that you can respond to uh, by raising your hand if they pertain to you. So let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Jesus, we are so grateful for the word that we've heard this morning, these words that you shared with your disciples on the eve of your uh, betrayal and crucifixion. And Lord, we sometimes find it challenging to live that kind of life characterized by your peace and, and in the absence of anxiety. And, and so, Lord, we, we want to give opportunity for any that are here today, if they don't have that kind of relationship with you, where they know uh, where they are going after they, after they leave this earth, they know the kind of thing that you've done for them in, in dying on the cross for their sins and providing for their redemption and their forgiveness. 
Uh, if anyone is here like that, that doesn't know Jesus personally in this way, you can know him even this morning. And if you know him, you would be eligible to be baptized as well. Uh, if there's anyone like that, I'd like to pray for you. With your heads bowed, could I see any hands of people who would want to know Jesus personally this morning that they don't? Yes, okay, amen. All right, Lord, we pray for this one who has uh, lifted her hand, and Lord, we pray that, that the assurance that you give us by knowing you would be in her life. I pray that you will make real to her your death, your crucifixion, your resurrection uh, was all for her, God, so that she could know you, that she could know uh, the Father through you, and that she could live forever with you in these beautiful rooms that are prepared for us. God, I pray that you will uh, give her that assurance even today. Second question, is there anyone here who would say, in this interim period while we're waiting for Jesus to return, I would, I would say I'm, I'm struggling with anxiety. I, I have a lack of peace. I know Jesus wants me to have peace, but I, I feel a lot of anxiety at times. I'm troubled in my spirit and in my life. If that's you, can I see your hand? I would want to pray for you today also. Yeah, some hands are going up. And so, Father, we, we want to receive your peace. We know that you emphasized and re-emphasized peace to your disciples. You don't want them to be afraid. You don't want them to be troubled or anxious. You said, I'm giving my peace to you. God, help us to receive it. Help us to live lives characterized by your peace. Help us to live even carefree lives, God, in these days, which seems so contrary to how we would normally live. But Lord, that's what you said. You said you want us to live in your peace. And I pray that we would all know that peace, that deep peace that comes from within, not because things are right on the outside, but because things are right on the inside. And the last question I'd like to ask is, it could be that as I've shared this message this morning that, that some of you would say, I, I want to be more active in sharing my faith uh, until Jesus comes. Uh, though There is a chance for others to come to know him, and I, I want my family to know him, I want my friends to know him, and I want to be able to share the good news with them uh, without hesitation and with, and with confidence and boldness. If there's anyone like that that would say, yes, I, I want prayer like that, I want to be more bold in my witnessing, yes, I see hands going up, thank you, thank you. Lord, you can see that many here uh, are, are anxious, uh, or not anxious, but they are, they are serious about sharing the hope that they have with others. And Lord, we know that we have the opportunity to do that uh, because you have not returned yet, and you are not returning because you want more and more people to come to know you and your Father. And so, Lord, for all those that raise their hands, and all of us, God, we, we, we say we want to be active in sharing our faith. We know that, that sometimes we don't know what to say, but you said when we don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit would put words in our mouths and help us to speak the things that would be needed. And so, Lord, I pray that you would use us. I humbly ask that you would put us in situations where people would be receptive to hearing the, the message of Jesus, the good news that we have to share. And Lord, I thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. And, and we all said, amen, amen and amen. So, uh, Pastor had told me that if I was good this morning, I could play you a song. And uh, that is what I'd like to do right now with Aria. Going to play a, a song for you on the Irish whistle. This song is called Be Thou My Vision. And uh, for any of you who have Irish background, I'm dedicating this song to you. <laughs> 